Okay, so we've gotten into resin printing and we're able to print successfully. If not, please check out my earlier video on how to set up any resin printer. Yes, it's based on miniatures, but since these are some of the most detailed things you can print, if you can follow that guide, it'll work with anything you want to print on a resin printer. However, if you're looking for perfect results, you need to keep going and dialing in your printer further. Now, I could show you a step-by-step -step process, but what's right for me isn't right for everyone. So instead, I want to give you the knowledge and confidence to decide for yourself. At least then, if any issues occur in a print, you'll know how to resolve them. Hi, I'm Ross, and this is Farhammer Videos. I am going to assume a couple of things before we begin. I'm going to assume you've been able to print on your printer. Keep watching, but my earlier video may help you get started. I'm also going to assume that you understand that having consistent resin temperature throughout your print is vitally important. If you dial in your printer during the day and everything looks great, when the temperature drops overnight, your resin becomes less reactive to UV light because it gets colder, and that can lead to failure. And if you don't have a printer yet, or you're looking for an upgrade, then you might want to know that temperature regulation is one of the key benefits of the Uniformation GK2. And it's only fair that I mention them since they're today's sponsor. Even with all the new printers coming out in 2024 with more advanced features, very few have taken heating as seriously as Uniformation did over a year ago. So when you combine that with all the other convenience features like a clippable build plate that won't unlevel, an anti-splash push fit vat, and easy screen replacements, you'll realize the more you print, 12K has little to no discernible benefit over 8K machines, so you'll quickly understand why this is still my top pick printer. You can of course watch my review or anyone's review for that matter because we're all saying this machine is great. Moving on to settings, let's start with layer height. It's worth noting that when this has changed, you'll need to amend several other settings too. The thicker your layers, the longer the curing time you'll need, and vice versa. The thinner your layers, the more detail you get from your models, but there are other methods to deal with this, but I'll come back to that at the end of the video. The fairly accepted standard value here is 50 microns, or 0.05 millimeters. But for the best detail, I tend to round it nearer to the pixel size of the screen or AVC if you've watched my 12K printers are irrelevant video. If my printer's pixel size or AVC is 28 or 34 microns, then I'll choose a 30 micron layer height. If it's 24 or 22 microns, I'll drop it to 20. Honestly though, you do you. This is one of the first parts of the 3D printing process where it's key to realize that much of this whole thing is down to personal preference. Now from here, I'll walk you through the settings in the order that they matter in terms of the print process rather than how they're presented to you in the slicers. The first thing to think about is bottom exposure time. If this is too low, the initial layers won't stick to the plate, and if it's too high, you'll need to chisel them off. To get this right, I recommend printing these squares created by Dennis Wang. In your slicer, just put one of these squares in the corners of your build area and one or more in the middle of the plate. If only some of them stick when you printed it out, it's likely your plate's not level or your screen's busted. Take the bat out and check your screen. When it comes to bottom layer count, which is how many bottom layers you have, I've always aimed for around 0.2 millimeters of base layers. So to get this, you might need to do some math determined by your layer height. If you're using 50 micron layers, this is four layers. But if you drop down to 20 micron layers, then it might be better to increase this to 10 layers. Now the next one is transition layers, and people tend to get a bit confused by this. The count is the number of layers where the exposure time incrementally decreases between the exposure time for your bottom layers and the exposure time for your normal layers. So a transition from 30 second base layers or bottom layers to five second normal layers using four transition layers will cure each of those transition layers for five seconds less than the last. Now that's not a realistic example, but it keeps the math simple to follow the principle of what this does. But when should you change this? Well, if you're getting prints where the base and maybe some of the supports begin to print, but then suddenly everything is torn away and stuck to the release film, increasing your transition layers could help. 
However, there are times where it may not be that. It may in fact be due to your wait times or lack thereof, or it could be due to your lift speeds, which I'll come on to shortly. To understand your wait times, it's best to understand the process that a printer goes through in each layer sequence. When a layer is cured, the print bed then lifts, and once it's lifted to its set height, it then lowers again, and the lowering is referred to as retracting. So rest before lift happens after a layer is cured and the UV light turns off. This value is the wait time between that light turning off and the bed starting to lift. I've never set this value, I keep it at zero and I've never had a problem. If you know a reason to wait at this stage, then please let me know. Now knowing that, rest after lift should be self-explanatory. This is a wait time between the bed lifting and retracting, and I tend to set this to about five milliseconds. Now, don't get me wrong, there may be no reason for me doing this, but I treat it like reversing a car. Bring the car to a stop before driving forwards. So to me, it's the same with the motor for the Z-axis here. That five milliseconds is just a definite stop point before the motor suddenly has to spin back in the opposite direction. I may be wasting my time doing this, but on some psychological level, this makes sense to me. Feel free to leave this at zero and we'll see whose motor lasts longer. And that's not sarcasm. I genuinely wonder if this logic is sound or if I'm just wasting my time. And finally, you have weight after a track. So this is after the plate has lowered and before the light comes on for the next layer. This pause time allows your resin to stop moving before it starts curing the next layer. The less fluid high viscosity resins need more time to settle before curing the next layer. Typically anyway, this could be another reason why your print fails halfway through is if you're not giving the resin enough time to settle before you're curing your layers. Now the main setting in this list that we should all be familiar with is one that you'll probably change most frequently when dialing in a printer, and that's the exposure time for normal layers. And for dialing this in, I recommend you watch my aforementioned earlier video on how to print miniatures. If this is too low, your model will fail or have some peeling defects. If it's too high, small details will be overexposed and bloated. And whilst the XP rangefinder I always show will demonstrate XY dimensional accuracy, which is great for demonstrating what printers can do in reviews, it won't determine that your models will print. That's just a quick test that will get you started. Another useful test is the Cones of Calibration by Table Flip Foundry, which is more of a tensile strength test. In general terms, if you dial in your exposure time so the success side of the cones all print and connect in the middle, and the fail side cones all break in the middle, this should indicate that most pre-supported models online will print. Except when they don't. That's a whole different topic, but pre-supported and well-supported generally mean two different things. But where your models still don't print, meaning the supports fail or something similar, it's more likely down to the supports on that particular model. So if you're still getting fails after doing all this, don't worry, I do too. Either add more supports or up your exposure time a bit. It's your call. And finally, we have our lift and retract speeds and distances to deal with. Now, this can look incredibly confusing, so let me break it down. First of all, we need to separate these between base layers and normal layers. So those base or bottom layers are the ones we talked about in the first step, the ones that stick your model to the plate. And the others refer to normal layers, which is the majority of the layers in your print. To break it down further, both the base layers and the normal layers have lift and retract speeds, and then they've got matching lift and retract distances. And each of those is also split into two values. So let's go through our layer process again to note what is what. And we'll start from once a layer is cured, the plate begins to lift, and your lift distance is split into two stages that directly correspond to the speed. Now for a 10 inch printer, I typically lift the bed for a total of eight millimeters, but I do this in two stages, three millimeters and five millimeters. Under the lift speed, this is also split into two stages, 60 millimeters a minute and 240 millimeters a minute. When you consider the lift distance and speed values as joined, what this means is that in stage one of the lift, I'm lifting the bed for three millimeters at a slow 60 millimeters a minute or one millimeter a second. And this is just to start the release film to peel away from the layer steadily rather than try to tear it away in one fast go. 
The second stage of 5mm is much faster at 240mm a minute or 4mm a second. And this is to ensure the previous layer has fully peeled away from the film whilst leaving a void for new liquid resin to flow into. Now you know this, which is the same for the normal and the bottom, base or burn-in layers, whatever you want to call them, your attract distances and speeds are the exact opposite of this. The plate can lower quickly initially, but it would be best to slow it down in the second stage because if you have any errant bits of cured resin loose in the vat, a rapid retract could more easily drive them through the release film and possibly even the LCD. But because there are no peel forces to worry about on the way down, the distance for the second stage of the retract doesn't need to be as large as your first stage of lifting. Now, if any of that bit was confusing, please don't worry, it took me a while to get it. And please rewatch it a couple of times or drop me a comment and I'll explain it in more detail if that helps. But if you're looking at this and wondering how you can increase the speeds of your printer, well, the main way to do this is by starting slow and gradually upping the speed with each print until you start to get failures. If you're printing too fast, then that also could be another reason why your prints are ripping in half partway through your print. And I want to bring this to a close here, and I know many of you want me to go on to anti-aliasing, which is a great function for reducing layer lines, but trust me, that will make a video in itself, and I really need to speak to Chitu Systems to get a better explanation of this than what they give you in the slicer, so please subscribe and watch out for that. But I hope at the very least this has given many of you a better understanding of the settings you're faced with on a daily basis. If you're getting fails in your prints now that you're armed with the knowledge of what each setting does, what do you think you could change in order to get more success? Try to think about the process of how a layer is cured, at what point do you think that process is breaking down? It should lead you to a solution faster than posting online and hoping for an accurate response this week. But I want to say thanks for watching and a huge thanks to our members for supporting our content. Their names are on screen right now. And a massive shout out to Uniformation2 for sponsoring this video. Please check out the GK2 using the links in the description. I want to say below, but YouTube keeps changing where the descriptions of videos are. So below, to the side, above, behind you. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz. And until next time, okie dokie. Fohammer out.